coordinating a road safety week or similar activities. I hope everyone logs on OK and can see the first slide, which is on screen now. Um, for those of you who missed it a couple of minutes ago, my name is Caroline Perry, and I'm Development Director at Break, the Road Safety Charity. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. If you experience any technical difficulties, for example, if you can't see the slides or you suddenly lose audio, um, if you send me a chat message, uh, I'll do my best to sort it out for you. I'm listed um, in the webinar as break staff if you're sending the message. So um, just send the chat message through. You'll find that in your webinar control panel um, and send it through to break staff, the organizer, and that will come through to me and I'll do my best to help you sort it out. Um, the slides that you see will be circulated after the webinar along with a link to a recording of it. Um, so you don't need to worry about uh, making lots of notes as we're going along. And all of you are muted at the moment as well, so you don't need to worry about uh, anyone else being able to hear you if you cough um, or anything uh, as we're going through. And finally, we'll be sending you a short feedback survey by email after the webinar. So please do fill these in and email them back to us. Uh, your feedback is really helpful to us um, in planning future events. So you should have received um, the agenda for this session by email. So you'll have seen that we have a packed and varied session with lots of advice on why and how you can run a road safety week or similar activity in your country or locality and also how you can use it as part of wider road safety activities. So firstly, um, I'll be explaining um, a bit about uh, the first principles and the benefits of running a road safety week or a similar activity um, and giving you some tools and resources that are available to help you on that. Then we've got Melanie Turner from Auckland Transport who will be talking about how they partnered with us for Road Safety Week 2014 in New Zealand and other activities that they run. Then Venera Owens uh, will discuss the NRMA's Science and Road Safety Day program. Uh, and our final speaker this afternoon is Ray Wynne Baldwin from the New Zealand Transport Agency who will talk about road safety education with schools and embedding road safety into the curriculum. And then we'll round up um, with a Q&A session and we'll finish by 4.30 New Zealand time. So uh, any questions that come in to the speakers, um, I'll be asking at the end of each speaker presentation. Uh, and we'll also do a little wrap-up session at the end. Um, if you want to pose a question to a speaker, all you need to do is type in your question in the question pane on your webinar control panel and submit it at any time. Um, and I'll pick that up. And um, pass on to the uh, speakers. So before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about Break for those of you who maybe haven't come across us before and why we're running this webinar. So we're an international road safety charity with offices in the UK and in New Zealand. We were founded in 1995 in the UK with two key objectives. Uh, one being stopping the carnage, so preventing road deaths and injuries, and the other being to support the victims, so people who have been bereaved or injured in crashes. We run Road Safety Week in the UK and have done so since 1997, and also in New Zealand um, since 2012. And this July, um, we've just launched our Road Safety Week Global Hub, which is a global website that anyone around the world can use to access activity ideas and resources and tools to help them to set up a road safety week. We've been able to establish the global website and the tools and guidance that are in it um, and to run these webinars thanks to very kind sponsorship from our partners RSA group. So we want to say a huge thank you to them for their support. So that brings us to the end of the introduction and now I'm just going to move on to my main presentation, um, which is outlining what we regard to be the main principles of running a successful road safety week based on what's worked for us in the UK and in New Zealand. So most of this is based on you setting up a road safety week, but it is worth checking first whether there is already one in your country that you can link into. 
Um, there's a range of tools and resources available on the Road Safety Week global website, including step-by-step -step guides to setting up a Road Safety Week for different types of organization. So I'll show you later on um, where these can be found. Um, but as well as this presentation, there's lots more useful information that you can find on there, which we just don't have time to go through um, in a webinar like this. And don't forget, we'll have a question and answer session. So if you think of anything you want to ask, just type it into the question box and send through to me. So why hold um, a Road Safety Week? So I'm hoping that because you're all here um, and taking part in this, that you're at least partially convinced of the reasons um, why you might organize a Road Safety Week or a, a similar activity. But I think it's important to start by thinking about the benefits you can deliver through an event of this sort. So road safety weeks are all about getting people's attention, making people think about road safety, and promoting safe and responsible road use. It's about getting the message across that every individual can play a part in making roads safer and preventing tragedies. So a road safety week can help you to promote general road safety awareness or to get specific messages out on key issues that are relevant to your country or your area. You can also use it to reinforce your other activities um, and embed it into year-round activities um, or use it to kickstart new campaigns or re-energize existing activities that you have. You can create a sense of importance around road safety and also use it use the week as a focal point, which then um, can be used to say kickstart other campaigns um, into the future as well. It's also a way of pooling your resources potentially with other partners and engaging wider audiences than um, your own organisation or community. And it's a way of empowering communities um, to give them that power in their local area to tackle road safety issues and to raise awareness of them. So the benefits of these have also now been recognized by the UN and the World Health Organization, who include getting more countries running a road safety week as one of the aims of their decade of action on road safety as well. So with breaks road safety weeks in the UK and New Zealand, there are two sides to how these events work, and both are really important and support one another. So we have a top-down approach to communications and media campaign, resources, guidance, and events and training. And through this approach, we measure the reach of Road Safety Week. And then our bottom-up approach enables communities to deliver local communications and campaigns in their area to disseminate resources and deliver local education, events, and fundraising. So through these activities, we measure involvement in the week. Of course, to deliver the bottom-up side of Road Safety Week, um, there's still a lot of work for you to do as organizers to encourage and help people to get involved at community level. The first step is choosing a theme and the time of year um, that works for people you want to get involved. Good timing is especially crucial to securing good levels of engagement from schools who tend to be very busy at certain times of the year. And we also take care to choose a theme that will work for as wide an audience as possible and doesn't exclude anyone. For example, if we had a theme that specifically targeted cyclists or parents or motorbikers, that doesn't work for lots of people. So in order to engage as many people as possible, we go for a wide theme. And following that, we market that um, by various community communication channels and partners targeting all different types of organizations, um, as well as road safety professionals and other groups. Um, we direct people to our website um, for more information, and then offer through that tools and advice, um, ideas, and also webinars. And then they read those ideas and register to get an action pack following which they also receive countdown bulletins, um, as well as the action pack, which has lots of ideas and guidance and tools, which I'll show you a bit more about shortly. They also then feed back on how it went, and we use that feedback and save our contacts to build on what we've done for the following year. 
So this is the Road Safety Week section of the Break New Zealand website. It's our main hub of information and ideas for participants, which all of our marketing directs people through to. It gives ideas for people to take part and divert them through to the registration form. Um, and the form collects information on what people are planning to do, as well as their details, who they are and where they are, how many people they're planning to get involved in their activities. So we collect a lot of data through those forms. It also signposts people to activities that are happening during the week, such as the ones that um, Melanie will talk about later, and also to additional resources to assist people to take part, which may be from BREAK or from other agencies. So for example, we link through to the Transport Agency curriculum resources that Ray Room will be talking about later. And this is the action pack and that everyone who registers gets sent. We use a low-cost email service so it looks professional and it's clearly laid out and it helps to promote the key services and also activities that we run that we want people to take part in during Road Safety Week. It includes guidance on ways our different stakeholder groups can get involved um, and it also encourages groups to fundraise for us. And then crucially, it includes a host of resources like posters and web banners that participants can use to promote road safety awareness, um, especially linked to our chosen theme. So there's all sorts of different resources in there that people can download and print as they wish, depending on what suits their activities and their organisation. It also aims to promote wider and longer term engagement with break as well and road safety. Um, such as by signing up to our news bulletin, following us on social media, or getting involved in other activities. So moving on to how uh, different types of organisations might engage in Road Safety Week. Um, this is a made-up example of how a school might get involved in Road Safety Week from start to end. So. They might first of all get an email from their local council or road safety professional about Road Safety Week. So this is an example from the upcoming Road Safety Week in the UK. Then they might go to the website to find out more information, read ideas and case studies, like the sound of running lessons and maybe wider activities because they're concerned about the safety of the children who attend their school and so they register using our online form. They may have road safety embedded into the cur curriculum already and use Road Safety Week as an opportunity to engage students in more activities or to perhaps engage parents too and the wider community or they might run additional activities that add value to things that they're already doing. So then they get an action pack by email and they read some of um, our online information about teaching road safety and they might also sign up to break the term the educator email bulletin. And then they plan and run lessons for pupils um, using the guide which is linked from the action pack and other curriculum resources they have access to um, to develop their activities that they actually do during the week. So an example could be things like measuring out stopping distances at different speeds. And then the kids are asked to design their own posters um, as part of, of that to display in reception. They might run a, a beep beep day or similar activity for the youngest year group, um, running fun activities on road safety basics. And they might also invite along a local road safety officer or police education officer to help with that as well. So then they might uh, also run a bright dress down fundraiser where every child wears their brightest clothes instead of wearing a uniform and is asked to make a gold coin donation to break which helps to raise awareness about drivers looking out for kids on foot as well as fundraising. They put information on the school website 
and an article in the school newsletter in advance and afterwards post photos on Facebook and encourage parents and other drivers in the area to slow down for the children outside their school. And then finally, they decide to run an ongoing slow down campaign throughout the coming year to continue to raise awareness among local drivers about protecting children and to talk to their local council about whether the speed limit might be lowered outside their school. So again, this is a made up example this time of how a company might get involved in the week. So they find out about Road Safety Week through Twitter and then click through to the Road Safety Week website and register to get involved. Again, they get um, an action pack and then monthly countdown bulletins with ideas um, for taking part and to help on their activities. They might decide to sponsor a Road Safety Week banner and have that up outside their company offices to raise awareness or to put it outside a local school. They can also get over the phone advice from break on other activities. And they might plan and run activities promoting the break pledge to staff through emails, intranet, staff magazine, quiz in the canteen, and perhaps a road safety day with free tyre checks or vehicle checks, checking of child restraints and child seats um, in vehicles of families. Um, or running a poster competition for the children of employees. So there's lots of different types of activities that companies do to get involved. And then they might issue a local press release saying how many staff have made the pledge and calling on others to do the same. They put posters up on the week and read Breaks Guide on Road Risk Management and subscribe to our information service for um, fleet professionals and road safety professionals to help with their ongoing work and um, working with their employees on road safety. So our final example is of road safety professionals. They might see an article in the Break News Bulletin or they might be familiar with Road Safety Week already from previous years. They are persuaded to register because there's free resources like downloadable posters and web banners and guidance reports that will get in their action pack and also the opportunity to engage further with their local community and perhaps promote existing work that they're doing and extend that further. They might already be working with primary schools but want to encourage early years road safety education and develop some young people engagement work. So. They take part in a Road Safety Week webinar for professionals, which gives them ideas, at which they hear about the beat day and decide to promote that to early years educators in the area, and also offer advice to those early years centres in advance and follow-up visits. They might arrange with local road safety professionals, such as police, um, to work with schools or local colleges to run um, discussion workshops on the impact and causes of crashes and provide teachers with information and follow-up activities and curriculum learning. They can use brakes film clips to spark discussion and encourage young people to make brakes pledge as well to use roads safely and sustainably. They promote activities via their local magazine and social media and a local press release which helps to get the message out more widely and encourages the wider community to make the pledge. And there are lots of other ways that professionals get involved as well. For example, they might target the whole community by holding a road safety fun day at a community venue or have stands at local markets or shopping malls or other community areas during the week at which they give advice on particular road safety topics. So when we look at REACH, um, it's impossible to gauge exact reach with something like this, um, but to give you some examples, this is from um, the UK Road Safety Week last year, and they're using this infographic to promote Road Safety Week this year. Um, so in the UK, 
week in 2013, 63 marketing partners helped them to secure those registrations. And the registrations were about 80% schools, 10% employers, 5% road safety professionals, and 4% communities, and 1% others. And the feedback was collected on 564 activities and positive feedback, as you can see, on resources and information. In New Zealand's week this year, we had 18 partner organizations promoting the week um, for us. Uh, we had a similar split of participants. Um, in terms of the, the range of schools, employers, road safety professionals, and feedback on 142 activities. And again, um, positive feedback on those resources and the information that's provided. We also um, put together an evaluation report with all of this information in, um, which helps us to evaluate um, the reach and the involvement in the week and the success of the week, and also to collect feedback from people who've taken part, as I said earlier, so that that informs um, future road safety weeks as well in terms of what works and um, what could be changed or done differently. So this is how we do the top-down elements. Uh, select a theme and develop the messages gather research and information which can be used um, as part of that theme that's relevant to it, and then produce from that relevant um, resources, as I mentioned, posters and um, banners, uh, other downloadable guidance um, for different types of organizations. Um, we also create newsworthy content, so we might conduct a survey with drivers or um, with young people or school children about the particular issue. Um, and what they think of it, and use those survey results in our media work around Road Safety Week. We develop media events and activity concepts um, and arrange spokespeople for those media events, um, including campaign spokespeople and also um, people who have personal experiences of road crashes, so they've been bereaved or injured themselves, and road safety experts in that particular um, topic as well. We then set up um, media events and prepare visual content around that for photos and filming opportunities to um, create media releases around that and sell those in um, to media to build those relationships and help to get to raise as much awareness of Road Safety Week as possible. We also deliver social media and direct communications and then evaluate the coverage and save all our contacts for the following year to follow up. So Road Safety Week in New Zealand and the UK have a different theme each year. Um, if you're linking into an existing week in your location, it's worth looking at whether you can link into that theme or need to have a different theme because of your audience or local issues. And it's a good idea to think in advance about what road safety issue or issues you will focus on, what you're aiming to achieve, and what messages you want to promote. So having a theme can help to give your activity a focus and make it memorable. Um, but it, it needs to be wide enough to work for different participants in the target audiences that you want to reach, but specific enough to work in communications um, of the week and to make sure that those messages are clear. So the top priority is having clear messages that people can relate to. But you also need to consider any barriers to certain messages as well. For example, people underestimating risk or thinking that other people are the problem and not necessarily themselves. So your theme and messaging needs to be clear about what you're asking people to do, why it's important, and that it applies to them. So you can see the guidance on uh, the Global Road Safety Week site. Um, there's lots more detailed advice in the publicity and media guides in there on messaging and creating a theme. Um, and I'll show you where that is later on. So this is an example of the theme we used for Road Safety Week um, in New Zealand this year. You can see we have a simple catchy strap line, um, an overarching universal aim, and then some very specific clear messages, usually geared at drivers given their responsibilities on the roads. And we run media events based on the theme too and use additional information such as event statistics and case studies from bereaved and injured volunteers in our media work where it's appropriate. 
So this is a photo from our national launch event this year, which was school students uh, used a driving simulator at that launch and took part in other activities simulating distractions behind the wheel. Again, this is our theme for the previous year. Um, and again, you can see it follows the same format, uh, key messages, media events around the same messaging. And these are some TravelWise ambassadors at a school in Auckland that did our Road Safety Week launch that year. And they were highlighting that children want to walk and cycle to school, um, but often can't because of the speed of traffic in their area. Um, and they were urging drivers to slow down outside their school. So these are some results from our media campaign in New Zealand um, from this year. Coverage is at least this. Here we don't have a, a media monitoring service. Break um, doesn't currently. In the UK, um, Break does use media monitoring, so they have much more accurate information about how um, much, how, what wider reach uh, Break has um, through media during Road Safety Week there. So here in New Zealand, it's at least this. Um, there's probably more that we aren't aware of currently. So how do you fund your week? Um, advanced planning is key to determine what you're going to do and what funding you need. And give as much, yourself as much time as possible to find that funding as well. You can capitalize on the PR benefits, because there are a lot of PR benefits um, for sponsors of a road safety week, which is something that companies um, like to see as well. And having a combination of corporate sponsorship and government grants could be a good um, funding model for you. Um, in the UK, that's what Road Safety Week has, is a combination of that. Um, here in New Zealand, we have a corporate sponsor of the week. Um, and have a clear benefits package for sponsors um, as well to make it clear to them um, what, what the week will entail and what they can get out of it as well. Uh, and also encourage fundraising by participants. So um, break as a charity, we're reliant on fundraising from communities, schools, and companies. So as you've seen, we encourage people to fundraise during our road safety weeks through bright days and other activities. And we also have people fundraising for break throughout the year as well um, by doing things like climbing mountains, running marathons, holding bake sales, and lots of other fun activities. Um, so that's a really important part of what we do um, as a, an organization um, to support the work that we're doing. And if you are interested in finding out more about the kinds of fundraisers that are there or supporting Break Yourself, if you're able to, again, there's more information on the Road Safety Week Global website. So I've mentioned a number of tools to you throughout the presentation. Um, there's lots of information available through the Global Road Safety Week site, including the step-by-step -step guides that I mentioned. Um, and also available online are various other guides, so I'll just quickly show you where these are. So you can see on the website um, along the top, depending on what type of organization you are, you can click on there and you've got guidance available um, both as web pages and downloadable as PDF documents as well. Our tools and resources page um, also has lots of different uh, resources um, split into different road safety themes um, and also road safety week promotional resources such as posters with space for the date of road safety week and then banners that can be downloaded and used on social media or um, on websites as well. So there's lots of different things there too. Um, and we also have a publicity and media campaign guide, community campaigning, and um, information for educators as well on teaching road safety, all of which is available through this site. And the break pledge I've mentioned a few times, which is a really useful tool um, for you to use as well. It's six simple rules for safe and sustainable roads. So I would encourage you to have a read of the pledge and sign it yourself um, and also encourage others to do so. So that, again, there's lots of information and resources around the pledge available on the website. The Break Shop uh, also has some resources that um, 
are available uh, to download or to purchase on break handship items internationally too. Um, so if I wanted to have a look at that, again, there's links through from the Road Safety Week website. And we also have our domestic websites, which you can use for ideas, um, additional ideas as well. So to finish off, these are our top tips. Um, go big, emphasize that Road Safety Week is for everyone and be clear about your messaging and um, your theme for the week, but be flexible about how people can get involved as well. Choosing a theme that works for the maximum um, number of participants in your week. Uh, detailed planning is key and maximizing sponsorship to cover your costs as well. So thank you for listening and um, good luck in your activities. Please also tell us about them at the Road Safety Week Global website. We do want to know about what other people are doing. Um, and we will be featuring more case studies on the website, growing the map of case studies which is on there currently. So we'd love to know what you're doing um, and potentially include you on that map as well. Now I'm just going to check whether I've got any questions through um, before I hand over to Melanie. So again, if you have questions at any time, please them through. Um, I've got one from Venera, one of the speakers, who has asked um, whether we can provide examples of themes that have proven successful. So the two themes which um, I mentioned earlier were both successful, the tune-in, which was around driver distractions on streets of people, which um, was around safe walking and cycling in particular, um, but the fact that streets are for everyone. Um, also, that the UK, um, we followed on, New Zealand has followed on from the UK in terms of their um, theme each year. Uh, so the UK, um, a couple of years ago, also did this one, which was uh, Go20, um, and that was a big uh, walking and cycling theme which they did, which was highly successful too. Um, so I think the key learning from the theme is that to pick a, a catchy theme, a catchy title, um, but that's wide enough um, that it can relate to a lot of different people and people can interpret it um, to fit their own audiences and their organisations. And that's where we found that it works, um, so long as we have some specific messages as well um, in terms of the communications and media work. Uh, I've also got a question um, from Francis around whether the website um, provides examples of road safety activities for children. Yes, it does, and it also links through to um, some other activities, I believe, for children that might be available through other websites too. So um, yes, go onto the website and have a look in the uh, area which is aimed at schools for that kind of information. So I think that's all of my questions uh, at the moment, which is great, thank you for those. And so I'm going to hand over next to Melanie, who is our next presenter. So Melanie, can you hear me? Hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Okay. Great. We can hear you. So I awesome. will um, just make you the presenter. Uh, so if you get ready to show your screen. Yep. Great. And we're ready to go whenever you are. Okay, fabulous. All right. Okay, so, hi, I'm Melanie, um, and I work at Auckland Transport. I'm the Senior Regional Advisor for Schools here at Auckland Transport. So, we have a team who deliver a program called Travelwise in our schools um, across the region. Um, and today, Carolyn has asked me to talk about how we partner with, partnered with Break to deliver Road Safety Week this year, and how um, we are obviously going to continue doing that, but some ideas for further improvement. So, I thought I'd give you a quick update or introduction really on who we are, um, where Auckland is, a bit about Auckland because obviously um, we've got some international listeners, um, why we believe relationships are important to the delivery of our program, 
um, we actually see it as a fundamental component of our programs, so I'll talk about that in some detail. And then I will give you a quick rundown of how we ran Road Safety Week this year with Brake um, and some ideas for improvement. So, Caroline mentioned uh, in her talk about the Decade of Action for Road Safety, which is the international st strategic direction, I suppose, that we work to as well. Um, the international efforts to address road safety can be traced upwards, obviously, to the United Nations Decade of Action for Road Safety. On 11th of May 2011, the United Nations and the World Health Organization announced the start of the Decade of Action for Road Safety, with the ultimate goal um, being to stabilize and reduce the forecasted level of road traffic deaths around the world. The United Nations estimate that as part of this decade of action that 5 million lives could be saved during the decade, which is, is quite a significant amount. As a result of the decade of action, the United Nations developed a, goal, a global plan as an overall framework for activities which may take place in the context of this decade. And just this year, in April, uh, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a further resolution on improving global road safety. So New Zealand, as well as probably most of your countries that you're listening from, um, are party to this decade of action for road safety. And our strategic document, so the way that we deliver our commitment to this um, decade of action, is called Safer Journeys. And I'll show you um, a slide of where you can have a look at the Safer Journeys document, as well as some more information about decade of action in just a sec. So the strategic document, Safer Journeys, is our government strategy to guide improvements in road safety over the period 2010 to 2020. So the Safer Journeys Action Plan was released in 2010, coinciding with the Decade of Action. Um, and the vision is a safe road system, increasingly free of death and serious injury. And um, Safer Journeys also introduces the safe system approach to New Zealand. So prior to that, we had um, an outdated version of the safer system approach. Um, now our, everything that we do, I suppose, should really link to the safe system approach. So I'll show you a picture of that in a sec, so you get the idea. Auckland has been identified by the New Zealand Transport Agency as requiring additional high-risk focus on reductions in fatal and serious road injuries for pedestrians and cyclists. And, um, and I'll probably flick over to show you the websites where you can get this information from. So. This is the United Nations official website for the um, Decade of Action. It has all of the information that you could possibly need if you were wanting to write a strategic framework for your road safety week. So if you needed to tie it into something, something bigger than just you, obviously the United Nations is a, <laughs> is a pretty awesome place to start. Um, but most countries will have, hopefully, a, um, a plan of action to address the Decade of Action themselves. So this is our version, this is Safer Journeys, um, and you can click through all of the page, you can find the action plans, you can find out more information about the safe system, which is this little circle here, um, and hopefully then you'll at least be able to have a strategic framework from um, something to work from. All right, so back to this. For the non-Auckland listeners, now I did ask Caroline how many people were from Auckland, so sorry to bore you Aucklanders who probably already know me anyway, but um, if you don't know anything about Auckland, here's a um, Auckland 101, I suppose. So Auckland is the most populated and the fastest growing region in New Zealand. We're the little green arrow. Um, we're the skinniest part of New Zealand, um, but we're the most heavily populated. So we're a rapidly growing city. Um, estimates are that our population will reach 2 million by 2030, which probably seems to some of you not that much, but it's a lot to us considering our, um, our entire country is only 4 million people. Um, so that's, you know, 600,000 more people coming into our region in 15 years, which is quite significant and it will obviously have large impacts on our transport infrastructure. Um, another significant demographic feature of Auckland is that we're the largest Polynesian city in the world. 
200,000 people declared themselves as Pacific Islanders in the most recent census, which was last year. Um, and in the 1960s, the government brought a whole bunch of people over um, with this big industrial boom that we had um, as immigrant workers. And ever since then, we've sort of snowballed. And now we've got such a diverse population. Um, we have all sorts of different populations across the region. And um, I, I, suppose the, I suppose that means that we have to target our activities in a variety of different ways, which is tricky, but it's also really awesome to be in such a diverse city. So I thought I'd give a bit of a history also about Auckland transport, uh, Auckland's transport system. Um, in 1953, construction began on our motorway, which um, has led to a bit of a problem for us because we are now really um, sprawling. We're low density, we're car dominated, and um, our region is quite huge. Uh, to get around in Auckland, it's a bit tricky. We are trying to grow our public transport system and we're making a really awesome effort of it. Over the past few years, we've made um, leaps and bounds in this area, but we're still nowhere near um, up to the same standards as other international cities, but we're getting there. Um, but I suppose that's the role of um, us, Auckland Transport, is to implement transport infrastructure <laughs> so we can do things from walking and cycling infrastructure, road safety projects, engineering projects as well as the program that I work on which is Travelwise. So um, Travelwise is a school based program um, and we have been running since 2004 so we're in our 12th year and our program's goal really is to reduce morning congestion increase road safety and participation in active transport modes as well as public transport and improve health and reduce vehicle emissions. Um, we work with schools to deliver a whole school approach to road safety, which I'm sure Raywan will talk to you all about um, in her presentation. Um, the goal being that um, the whole school approach encourages schools to incorporate road safety and sustainable travel into their school culture their governance and their long-term planning. Uh, like I said earlier, a core function of our program is partnerships. And um, not only do we partner obviously with the schools to deliver our program, but we partner with key agencies, New Zealand Transport Agency, um, the New Zealand Police, but obviously um, not just government organisations, NGOs and um, organisations like Break New Zealand and Safe Kids are core partners um, and obviously we try and build a stakeholder relationship with just about anybody who can because there's real value in partnerships. So we have 402 Travelwise schools across the region, um, which is about 75% of all Auckland schools. Close to 203,000 students attend a Travelwise school and we're not just for primary schools, we run activities in primary, intermediate and secondary schools and you can see from um, the little image on the side, we're getting up there with um, our areas, we're our biggest growth that we'll be looking to um, grow our program further is in the south of our region, which um, has the highest road risk unfortunately and it also has the um, higher population of Maori and Pacific Island people in Auckland. So there's lots of things that point to a growing need in this particular area, but obviously we want to grow the program across the region still, and there's still room to grow in both of um, central and west and north of Auckland. So on to partnerships. Um, like I said, a fundamental component of our program is partnerships, but it's not just something that we've made up and we think is um, something nice to have. In the past it was sort of seen as a nice to have, oh yeah, we'll do it as a token effort and all of those sorts of things, but partnerships, um, it's a well researched now that if you can work in collaboration with others, you're going to have more effective program outcomes. So um, historically, and I'm not sure if this is the same across the rest of the world, but historically in New Zealand, road injury and death um, has, been in, has been viewed by um, the population as a role to be addressed by the government or by us, Auckland Transport. The amount of emails that we receive saying, 
um, do something to fix this road outside our school because um, death, uh, death will happen or it's ine inevitable that somebody will die on our streets, um, highlights the fact that road safety is seen as purely a government problem um, or a local government problem and that the wider community isn't really um, seen as the ones who can affect change. But we're hopefully trying to change that approach um, because really it shouldn't just be up to one organisation to deal with all of these things. So that's where we see the value of partnerships. Obviously governments um, play a role in policy creation, investment, enforcement, education, those sorts of things. But civil society such as universities, they build the research base for us to work to, they help us understand and evaluate the issues. Um, civil society like advocacy groups help engage communities that may have a distrust for local government or government organisations. But society at large, so the general population, um, plays probably the most vital role by adopting the safe behaviours, demanding safer conditions. Um, private businesses, they also play an important role um, by producing safer vehicles, safer products, um, participate in policy dialogues. Um, essentially society is the giver and the receiver because if you're giving taxes as a, you know, a person in society, you expect things back. And so I suppose that's really, um, the role of society isn't really just to exist, it's to participate. So when I was writing this presentation, I thought about when I first started in road safety and it was really um, uh, let's stick together sort of approach, approach to delivery. Um, we only really delivered with our little council and we delivered our activities and we had a few little token efforts here and there. But I mean it has only been five or so years, we've now moved into this partnership approach and um, understand the value of cross-sectoral partnerships. Um, and I think even in five years' time, we're going to have a lot better understanding of the value that each um, organisation or each group can play to the delivery of programme. So with that in mind, um, why we came together, why did Break and Travelways come together? Because um, I think that's important to note if we're thinking about partnerships. So Travelways Week um, is, was a regular event that we held every year. We've been running it since 2007. It used to be our most signature event on the Travelways calendar. Uh, in 2012, for example, we had 70,000 participants across the region participate in Travelways Week. And essentially Travelways Week was, here's a big um, calendar, stick it on your classroom wall and track every child who travelled to and from school that day over the week um, and track their travel mode. And so schools obviously went about it in a variety of different ways, but essentially it was that. It was a calendar, there was a tracking function, it produced a whole bunch of quantitative data and that was the end of that. So we started thinking really how meaningful is this activity. Um, it does exist, not as a once-off activity, it does exist in a full range of Travelwise activities that we deliver across the school year, um, but really how meaningful is it? So out of that 70,000 participants, how many of those people eventually changed their behaviour because of Travelwise Week? Um, we have a tendency in our promotional materials that we promote road safety as well as sustainable transport. So Travelwise really promoted active modes and public transport modes. Travelwise Week promoted those. Um, and the value of these large scale events and things and tracking individual mode share leaves a lot to be desired, but we're getting better. So anyway, Break came to us and said, why not join together considering we've got um, similar messages, we are wanting to run these activities at similar times and um, they also came to us in, with that recognition that large scale events, one off events probably aren't the best way of implementing change, it's actually best practice <coughs> to run activities over a variety of different times and periods as opposed to just running a once off activity and then running away and never being seen again. So although Break doesn't do that, there is only one of Caroline and um, I guess she could probably see 
the value in um, joining up with Travelwise, I'm assuming, Carolyn, that you could see the value of joining up with Travelwise seeing as we have um, a full year's worth of activity going on in most of our schools. The other thing was, um, and this shouldn't just be a passing comment, that in 2012 um, our dates were two weeks apart. So break ran their week a week before us in, um, in the school calendar and schools were confused. They were wanting a combined approach. They couldn't understand why they were running a road safety week one week and then a travel wise week the next week. Um, and also the break slash travel wise week was um, scheduled around an important time in the school's calendar, so back to school after the holidays is seen as a key time to promote road safety messaging, not only to parents but to children and young people who will be arriving back to school and maybe thinking about ways of changing their behaviour to and from school in that term. So how we came together, um, and this, like I said, this was our first year of running this together, so there's a lot to be learnt, but we also um, saw a real benefit in the way each organisation structured their um, program. So a break is an umbrella organisation really here in New Zealand. I know in, um, in the UK my managers advise me that, um, the, that break has a much bigger push um, with the NGO sector, but really here in New Zealand, in Caroline, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that break's an umbrella organisation with um, a media presence they have links across a variety of stakeholders, but really they're a national organisation who run the activity with one person. Whereas we, Travelwise, I suppose are from that bottom up approach that Caroline spoke about before, we have a team of 30 people who work across the region working one on one with schools on a regular basis. So a key performance measure for our community transport coordinators is meeting with Travelwise lead teachers on a monthly basis. So there's no one-off activity um, in existence in Travelwise. All of our programs are rolled over and rolled over and rolled over and aimed at achieving the school's vision statements of either road safety or sustainable transport. So we also have local and national stakeholders involved in our program. We're partly funded by NZTA and partly funded by Auckland Council. So um, we obviously have those stakeholders that are linked to both of those organisations. But we also have an online presence in schools. We have a program called the WOW program, which we launched, relaunched last year um, and is going great guns. So a lot of our schools now sign up to WOW as a travel-wise activity. So in 2014, um, we offered primary and intermediate schools, um, that calendar idea again that I was talking to you about before, but we did it through our online platform. Um, schools could continue running with their, what they knew Travelwise Week to be, which was that calendar, but it was an online forum and so it was easier, it was a lot less paper, um, it promoted that whole sustainability message a lot better. Um, but um, they still recognise it and I think that was the key. Um, it wasn't just some sort of random activity. So that was our like foundation program that we said, right, if you can't think of anything else yourself, here you go, we've done something for you. But really the essential component of Road Safety Week is that they run their own activities themselves. <coughs> Um, we tuned into road safety with our competitions because um, although the theme to us at Auckland Transport wasn't really that relevant to schools and young people, we could find ways of targeting that behaviour. Um, so we used our JTOC um, computer Oh, I don't even know what it's called. I suppose it's we, we go and have a look at all of the motorways and all of the road um, system around Auckland. We offer the class prize to go and have a look at that um, that unit here at Auckland Transport. Um, we offered, you know, prizes that were phones, video cameras, those sorts of things as prizes for coming up with road safety week activity ideas. Um, but really the whole tuning into road safety was really this whole online presence. It was really filling in that calendar, producing all that quantitative stuff and then, um, and then coming back to us with any extra ideas. Another program that we ran which um, was during Road Safety Week was our Make It Home Road Safety Expo which, was, um, which is currently being evaluated by NZTA and Raywind's team. Um, and 
this was the third year that we ran the Road Safety Expo and it's sort of morphed into more of a um, stage presence sort of activity and the problem being is that it was really a one-off activity. Schools arrived, they got the activity presented to them and they came back. So the ideas that we're looking forward to doing, developing curriculum resources, running presentations in schools and things like that, um, will hopefully address those concerns. But we had 500 young people from 15 schools across the region attend Make It Home, uh, which is a pretty good effort considering some of those schools would have travelled an hour, hour and a half to get to the venue. Um, so the event really was to break down the common attitude of this won't happen to me. So like I said, it was a bunch of um, activities and drama skits across the room that the young people tra travelled around, visited and had a look at and then after they went into that activity they moved upstairs and had a school conversation with a group called Attitude who, um, who are doing a lot of delivery for us going forward, um, who are youth development workers and talk to young people about um, how they can be safe on the roads. So. Um, this is really small and I apologise in advance for that because you probably can't really see too much but this is just a s very small snapshot of the schools that participated in Road Safety Week and some of the activities that they um, ran. So what I'm suggesting is don't try and like scribble all of these things down. I've got my email at the end of the presentation. If you want to know about any of these ideas or if you want to know any more information about any of these things then just flick us an email and I can explain any of these things to you. So this picture here that you can see um, is a campaign that we run called our Back to School campaign and uh, we have banners and flyers and all sorts of things that we hand out to schools across the region but because of the timing of Road Safety Week and I know that Caroline spoke about um, choosing an appropriate time of the year for running these activities. Because Road Safety Week was run during a back to school period, um, a lot of schools could chip into their normal travel wise activities and go, right, well, well we would have been running a back to school campaign anyway. We want our parents to think that um, of making changes or addressing congestion and those sorts of things in term two, which it was in term two. So, um, we provide placards, we provide banners, we provide all sorts of things to schools to support their messaging. So like I said, if you want to know more about Back to School or if you want to know about any of these other activities that you can see on this list, just let me know and I can, um, yeah, I can flick you some more information. So um, our suggestions for Road Safety Week, if anybody's running Road Safety Week, um, or looking to start one up is that it's never too early to start your planning. Um, we have a tendency to rush into our planning and not actually focus on what we're trying to achieve before we start doing the planning. So I think it's a yeah, it's an important thing to note that if you're running any sort of activity before you even start, you should think, well, what are we trying to get out of this? What are our key objectives? What are the what are the long term impacts that are going to um, <coughs> be part of this program, and how are we going to do to um, how are we going to plan this program to address those long term impacts? So, I think if you um, start planning well in advance, you've got your head around what needs to happen and how you want it to happen, then you can only, um, you can only be successful. Um, I also think another key thing when working with um, partners is having clear communication to each other around what each other expects of each other, how you can work together to um, create similar messaging, how you can work together to deliver one message particularly in schools who are bombarded with information. Um, when Caroline was talking about the themes and how important it is to have an overarching theme um, that's relevant, um, that's really important but if your key target group is 80% of the audience is children and young people and there's no attachment to the theme, then um, that's where problems can arise. So if you've got an overarching umbrella theme, that really um, works really well for a variety of organisations, variety of different sectors, finding ways of making that relevant is key. So 
tuning into road safety, for example, providing those prizes that I spoke about before, providing an online presence, just thinking outside the square. So it's almost like dovetailing on um, other people's work, but finding it um, finding relevant avenues for yourself. Also, I think it's really important to trust and respect the results that um, your participants provide to you as part of the evaluation after the event. Uh, there's a tendency to get so emotionally involved in activities that people lose sight of what the core outcomes and core objectives were of the program. So I think if you start focusing to, you know, really early on with your planning and remembering the core outcomes and then answering the, asking the questions of the participants um, in, in the hope and in the spirit of gratitude that um, what they're responding to you, you're going to make some serious change. I think that's key um, because then it'll show that your program is growing, it's moulding and it's changing and it's not just um, an, an emotional attachment to a program that might not actually be reaching your objectives. So anyway, um, there's the references that I referred to earlier on in the piece and my contact details are here. So like I said, if you've got any questions about any of those activities that happen during Road Safety Week in Auckland, just let us know. Or um, yeah, any questions? I'll um, hand back Thanks, to Carolyn. That was really interesting and great. Thank you very much for that. Um, if any questions, uh, if anyone wants to send a question through, if you do so, um, I've got one from Inu, um, which I think I'll leave to the end just because it might also apply to um, Rowan and Venera as well. So I'll just ask that one um, at the end. And so I think that's it, unless anyone types in a very quick question. Michael, hold on, there is one. That's it. So we'll uh, move on. Uh, thanks very much for that, Melanie. We'll move on to Venera next. So I'll just um, mute you now, Melanie, and then I'll yeah. shortly change the presenter over to Venera. Uh, Venera, I'm just unmuting you now, so we should be able to hear you. Can you just test that? Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Venera Owens. Yep. I'm from the National Roads and Motorists Association. Is it too early, Carolyn? Hello? No, no, that's great. Thanks. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that's all good. So if okay. you, um, it should have just, you should have just had yes. a message up saying that you're the yes. presenter, so you're still, yeah, that's <clears throat> working perfectly. So okay. um, that's fine. Start when you're ready. Okay, thanks. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Venera Owens. I'm um, from the National Roads and Motorists Association, the NRMA in New South Wales. We're a motoring club um, with a history of over 90 years on advocacy on road safety. And um, so this program sits within our motoring education suite. And the program is a call, we call it the NRMA Science and Road Safety Day. And um, I'm going to just to show you um, what the day is about. Before I speak about the day, I think a visual representation of what's going to ha what happens on a day. Uh, I'm going to show a video, and the video is of our launch um, in February this year. We actually started the program um, this year, and uh, I'll show you the video, and then I'll provide you some background.
Um, now, let me see if I can get back to um, my show. Okay, so essentially the, the day involves a whole day visit uh, of um, a presenter to a school to deliver um, three different science shows, each of them focusing on um, some key elements of road safety and we support the, the day with educational resources because we think it's really, really important that throughout the day that we don't want to make the day a one-off um, educational experience. We have on our website a lot of information for schools on road safety and we encourage schools to teach road safety and we have um, already a program where we produce education resources and schools order them from us. In the last three years we've had 500,000 different types of education resources being ordered from schools to use. So this was a program that we really wanted to implement that was us being in the schools and um, being and engaging with students. So as I said, it's a whole day program that we offer to schools free of charge. Every student participates. Students attend one of three shows. The show is very in length and in content and in the use of the sort of science terminology depending on the age of the children. The, sh the day is all about talking and uh, teaching children not just what to do. A lot of children hear about put on your seatbelt, wear your helmet, they don't understand the why and the how and we're using science as a mechanism to communicate and to demonstrate the forces that act on children in a car. So for instance, a lot of children have a misbelief that um, if they're in a crash, they can put their arms out and stop themselves from being propelled forward. They believe that if they are sitting in a car with airbags, that they don't need to use their seatbelts. So what we wanted to do was go beyond just the telling and showing them the why and the how. We made it really, really clear what we wanted to focus on, even though the shows contained a large amount of content around road safety, we also focus very, very carefully on seatbelts and on bike helmets. With seatbelts we had activities that uh, focused on um, making sure that children knew what seat, um, child seat they were supposed to be seated in based on their age and uh, we focused on reinforcing and showing children why if they were very short sitting in an adult seatbelt with a seatbelt resting across their neck why that was unsafe and that, that then led to the use of the booster seat, which we really explained was about making them taller. A lot of kids call that a child seat and they refuse to wear it, even use it, even though the law says that under the age of seven they must. And you know, we focus on making sure that kids understood where their collarbone and where the hip bone was and why it was important that the seatbelt sat on those different things. And then we looked at bike helmets. In Australia, a lot of children, most children wear bike helmets when they're riding, certainly in the cities. In the country, that's much less. But in the cities, most of them are wearing their bike helmets, but you only have to look around when they're riding to see that their straps are so loose that the helmets are sitting well back on their heads. and the Helmets will fall off their heads when they have a crash. So we made it a really important part of the show to make sure that kids wore their bike helmets, that they practice fitting their bike helmets on during the day, that if their straps are too loose, they had the opportunity in class with their teachers to make those adjustments. And we also focused on the need to, um, uh, you know, a why a bike helmet only is only uh, you can only wear it once, and we explained the way in which a bike helmet is designed so that the foot, the the foam compresses, and then why a bike helmet needs to be thrown away. We supported the show with um, the different workbooks for students to use, and online uh, resources for teachers to use. Now, road safety as as we all know, is not just about the school doing all the job or government doing all the job. Everyone's involved in keeping people safe. So part of the things that are driving this program is trying to inform children about the science, the knowledge, the, the, the information about road safety so they can take an active uh, approach to keeping themselves safe. We want them to become confident in speaking up when they see their parents acting unsafely or their, their friends doing something wrong. And Parents are also really important in road safety. We have many schools contacting us as part of our road safety grants program telling us that they have real issues with parents um, acting unsafely in school zones. So we wanted to make sure that we included parents within the day and so we had a parent workshop at the end of the day where we invited parents to turn up. 
we found that um, even though the feedback was fantastic, we didn't get a lot of parents, so we decided to, in season two, which we're currently running, to invite parents to attend, to, the, to attend the first show so they could see exactly what the kids were learning and they learnt more about road safety so they can reinforce those messages. Plus in the student workbooks we reworked those and introduced a four page insert specifically for parents on kids road safety. Um, we made sure that uh, parents were aware that the day was coming by providing this sort of gate sign that went up um, in prominent places where parents could see about the workshop and when to come. There were posters for uh, use around the school so the teachers were aware of the road safety day and who the contact person was. And we really wanted to understand the teacher and students uh, <coughs> feedback about the day and we had two online evaluation forms. One for the teacher and one for the class. So the class one was about the class thinking about the day as a whole and then making an assessment of the change in their understanding or learning as a result of the day and the teacher would scribe that for us. And we also provided a gift, um, a lovely branded water bottle um, <coughs> for each child so that we had a real, that we wanted the day to have a really a big wow factor, we wanted to make it truly, really memorable. We wanted the kids to race home and talk to their, kid, their parents about road safety, about what they learnt so that we sort of tried to complete the loop. All these resources were shipped to the school three or four weeks in advance so they had all the workbooks, they had everything they needed so they could look at them, hand them out, they could work on them on the day, the schools knew what they were doing, they could look at the online resources. <coughs> so again, the difference between this day and a lot of other programs was the use of science. Um, in New South Wales we don't have um, special science teachers in primary school so a lot of teachers don't do a, a lot of work on science and we felt that science was probably the, <coughs> the best way of demonstrating to children why those, we're, what the, what we're, why we're always telling them to stop, look, listen, listen and think. Why we're always telling them, for, to, telling them for, to watch out and make sure cars stop. Why we're telling them they must wear a seatbelt. So the whole thing is about um, this use of science to illustrate in a meaningful and simple way those forces that we know are in play when we're in motion. We really focused on a few key messages as I spoke about before and we assessed those and I'll go through those in a moment. And it was really, really about making sure that the children understood um, <coughs> about road safety, why they needed to do that, give them trusted authoritative um, knowledge without sort of value judgment so they could then uh, pass it on to their family and friends. It wasn't about shock or anything like that, it was just about fact. And we have very busy schools, schools are being called upon to do so much, um, not just teach the curriculum but also to do a lot more beyond that. And we wanted to make it really easy for schools and that's why we provided all the educational resources so that a school could have a really fantastic road safety day and know that and we knew that even if they just participated in the shows and completed all the workbooks they had a sound learning experience but if they went beyond that it would be fantastic and again it was all about a memorable learning experience um, we really did want kids to remember one or two important things um, and they're around seat belts and around helmets, but also to, to remember the day and to, to have something that they could refer back to when they find themselves in a road safety situation where they could have a dialogue with their parents about what they heard and what they saw. So um, in season one, we, we piloted the program uh, in three schools in February and we launched it at the end of February. And then throughout that season one program, we had two kits um, in school simultaneously five days a week for 12 weeks in a row. We had an outside presenting company that was specialist in science presentations. We created the concept and the content and we worked with them to create the science show to go with it and they, they presented the show. We attended every day. So um, we had 105 schools, 40,000 students and 1,700 teachers. The overall feedback um, out of five 
is as shown there, 4.2 for teachers, 4.3 for students and 4.5 for parents, which is really good. I've got more detailed um, breakdown that we'll have a look in a moment. We, have, uh, we had um, three times the interest for the 100 places, so we went out to schools in about um, September last year so that we made sure that we had everyone booked in uh, by November for the following school year and we were very pleased with the response. Um, season 2, which is now in the field, um, filled within uh, three days. So we've already got within uh, NRMA a very strong reputation for quality in terms of road safety education, but this program was very well em uh, embraced by schools. <coughs> so if we were to um, recommend the pro or to show you the processes that we, we used, first we decided we had to define the concept. What was it that we wanted to create? What, what was the purpose? And then we started to work on creating the learning activities that would be encompassed within that program. Then we looked at who could, who could present that, that program for us. Did we want to hire our own people or did we want to go out to a group of special presenters? Because we run this program, we decided to run this program as solid chunks. So when we're in the field, we're in the field. Like we've got two tours going on simultaneously, back to back, week on week, week, week after week. So we felt it was better to go with um, consultants, um, contractors to deliver it. We established the, the touring calendar. Then we uh, wrote to schools or emailed schools and asked them to express an interest in hosting the event. We collected the data that we needed plus the student numbers and the bell times and then we confirmed with the schools based on our touring schedule um, which schools had been successful. Now in Sydney it was relatively simple. We tried to split the, the schools around um, equally around all the different areas. In the country we had you know, we were in specific school, in specific areas and specific days, so we needed to make sure that, you know, we could have our presenter travelling um, around um, so that we could cover some, uh, you know, quite a, a big geography. New South Wales is a biggish state. Um, so we also kept in touch with schools, put information on our website. Then we, we made sure that we refined the content of the show and we rehearsed the show. We produced all the education resources. The workbooks took a long time to create and had them professionally uh, done uh, <coughs> with a designer. Had those printed and they were all couriered to schools well in advance. Now, to make sure that the day ran really well, we, made, we had a, a very defined run sheet which told us that the, the contact teacher everything they needed to know for the day plus the timetable and we rang the schools to confirm that um, they had received the run sheet, the, the run sheet was fine and the adjustments were made, they'd received all their, their resources, you know, sometimes, um, you know, they had an increase in students and we needed to send more stuff. And uh, we as an organisation have really high quality standards so we made sure that one of our staff members attended every performance. So we took that on rotation and um, even in the, in the country, we, in regional areas, we toured with the program. Um, so in terms of learning outcomes, as I said, we wanted students to be able to demonstrate, say that whether they could demonstrate, and of course the teacher had to check whether they could demonstrate those behaviours, and this is in the student outcomes. So in the student evaluation, we asked them to demonstrate, you know, um, how to behave in a car uh, and not distract the driver, because there was a really fun activity where they had to complete a skill tester in the car and the presenter was distracting them, so they could get a feel for what it was like to concentrate while being distracted at the same time. Um, so the feedback, as you can see, is all pretty good. Um, uh, holding hands and crossing the road, finding your hip and collarbone to seat your, your um, seatbelt correctly, uh, fitting your bike helmet, using the safety door and, of course, crossing the road. Most children know stop, look, listen and think, although very few actually understand what listen and think mean and very few remember, to, and, um, some of them don't re remember to um, to implement it, but that was a really, really important thing. And um, our <coughs> evaluation of the teachers, staff, um, we were keen to find out what they thought about the show and the workbooks, and the results there are quite pleasing as well. Uh, looking at the feedback, the written feedback from, from teachers about um, the content of the workbooks, we made some changes, we had them at around 20 pages, 24 pages and we 
we reduced them back um, significantly. And for the younger children, you know, we made sure that we used the right font so they could trace and all that sort of stuff. So um, I echo the comments of uh, Melanie from before to actually pay attention to that feedback. And I think we've, you know, really um, got a much tighter, a tighter set of workbooks now that we're really quite proud of. Um, and the parent workshop, um, we asked them a range of questions, but the two most important questions were, did you learn something new and do you think you're better equipped to keep your child safe? Um, and those were the results. Parents are really concerned about child restraints because um, two out of three in New South Wales are not correctly fitted and their children are always uh, trying to hop into the front seat or not wear their seatbelt correctly. and so. We spend a lot of time focusing on that um, because that's the sort of thing that parents are really interested in. Um, oh, and this is just a little bit about um, New South Wales. So what I'd like to do is um, go back to the front slide and have a look, <clears throat> have a look at um, the link to our website to show you some of the educational resources that we created. I'll just um, so <clears throat> a very simple um, web page. We have um, the opportunity for, for teachers to submit their evaluation form. Come back to the central page to submit their uh, student and uh, teacher evaluation data. Um, we provide information um, on what schools need to do to prepare for the day so that they know what's involved and how the day is structured. Um, we provide information on who our, our presenting, our science presenters are, obviously risk information. Uh, collect data on schools that have missed out and who, who are interested in and going on our um, alert lists so that when we announce the program next time they can participate. In season two we gave priority booking to schools that missed out in season one. And um, so I'm going to show you an example of a student workbook for early stage one which is kindergarten. Taking a little bit longer. Um, so I might just See if I can reduce this down a bit so that everyone can see it. Um, so that's the front page and so with the very young students it's particularly challenging because they don't read and so we had to do as much as we could graphically um, and provide sort of colouring in and opportunities for teachers to um, you know, have discussions with kids. So some of them are colouring in activities, um, some of them are really looking at the picture and what's, what's, uh, oops, what's, un, what's not safe there. Um, I think we have lost it. Uh, anyway, I'll let you have a look at those in your own time. They were quite um, a lot of work to create, but I think really, really important. Uh, we don't really, um, we're not very keen on uh, having a sort of like a, a one-off learning experience. We want to make sure that we have an integrated program that has activities before and after. On our website, um, on other pages of the website, there's lots of road safety information and on that particular page that is a bit too large to open. I'll see if I can do it again. Um, no, don't worry, Ralph. We can send around the. Um, yeah. we, we'll send around the links. And the there's slides, a so there's a heap of them. other um, activities. Uh, you know, like um, okay. Um, well, we'll just yeah, you know, click this open. Um, that that you know teachers can concentrate on 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 doing. So there's a heap of stuff there, um, and really we wanted to to do a comprehensive program but also allow teachers to have more information if they wanted to go further. So probably that's enough if anyone wants to ask any questions. That was great. Thanks very much for that, um, Venera. I haven't got any questions through at the moment, so um, see if any come through. But uh, given we are running um, slightly out of time uh, now too, I'll just 
uh, hand straight over to Ray Wynn. So thanks very much for that. Um, no problem. Manner, that was really great and really interesting to hear about all of your projects. So I'll meet you again now and um, unmute Ray Wynn and then we'll change over to the presenter again. Hey, hi, Ray Wynn, can you hear me okay? Kira, Kira. Um, hey, thanks. Uh, so we can sorry. hear you fine and I'll, I'll make you um, okay. the presenter so that you, we can see your slides. Okay. Um, so you should get a message up now. Something has happened. I'm just going back. There we go. Now it's right. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kato, tēnā falawa, malo alele, ko rewana hao, ko waka kutahi a hao. Hello everyone, I'm Raven Baldwin, Senior Advisor in Education at the New Zealand Transport Agency. My work is almost entirely in the compulsory schooling sector, which is this from five years to 18 years. And I'm going to talk about the curriculum resources, and these resources are the ones that are online that you are welcome to have a look at. And um, I am not going to stop and show you those, but they are right there. In this little uh, presentation, there are 20 slides, and I'm going to discuss teacher-centred and learning-centred and equity-centred learning. This means we work with teachers in the classroom and not in, um, and not out as the other two presenters have done in the field. We work in schools. Um, we work with teachers to put children at the centre of our learning process. And it also means that we really uh, support diverse and inclusive teaching. This little slide here is a, a quick clip from one of the teachers, an art teacher, um, who's written some work for us. And within the context of teaching and learning in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we're constructing flexible uh, participatory resources that can be used by teachers in classrooms. They all focus on teacher-led uh, and student-led and equity-led processes to celebrate student voice and agency. The New Zealand Transport Agency resources have at their heart citizenship. These resources have all been created and trialled by teachers and have been published by us. Each school in New Zealand, public, private or integrated, there are three existing systems, has a board of trustees which is unique to that school. And there are 2,700 schools which teach in, in English or in Māori. And those schools are able to support and enable a curriculum that best suits their community. I have just popped this slide up here in case you want to quickly note down any um, uh, things that you'd like to contact me about. The design and implementation of curriculum resources within the New Zealand Road Safety Education and Primary and Secondary Schools is supported by the New Zealand Transport Agency uh, alongside a suite of other actions and offerings and programs. You note in the diagram starting top left there's the Graduated Driver Licensing Program, our curriculum resources, social media for teachers, our multi-award winning design um, and advertising program. School Traffic Safety Patrol Team, so that's uh, people who manage traffic outside their schools and they're about 12 years old. Um, and the New Zealand Police, who we, uh, we partner with. Newsletters that go to schools, which there are about six every year that go out to schools talking uh, by teachers to other teachers. And we also run an online safe team driver and a practice program, which is run by my colleague Andrew Joel. So the curriculum resources are part of this whole suite of offerings that are, are created by the New Zealand Transport Agency. The resources which we are sharing are there to support teachers in schools for each curriculum area. There are seven curriculum areas in New Zealand and we have resources in all of them except for language and languages. Uh, just for instance, in drama at level 6, which is about 16 to 18 year olds, um, 
in as the last or the second to last year of school. Students will be assessed using an achievement standard, 91214, which is devise and perform a drama to realise an intention. The drama will could be from a perspective of a pedestrian or an onlooker or a passenger or a driver in a car. But most importantly, they're created by the students for other students based on the resources that have been created by an expert drama teacher, which are on our website. The New Zealand Transport Agency education resources are embedded in the curriculum and culture of each school. And they support student participation and connectedness to their school and their community. They support both the teacher and the student's self-worth and sense of accomplishment. The New Zealand Transport Agency is working with teachers and schools in a one-to-one -one relationship via a one-to-many model, much very similar to this, which is um, one person talking to a, a number of people. We value ako, which is a Māori term for reciprocal teaching, so students teaching each other their teachers and their communities. And this is in promoting effective interaction and relationships between teachers and students. We value kotahitanga, which is promoting and monitoring and reflecting on the outcomes that in turn lead to improvements in educational achievements. Our resources are flexible, so they are completely context-based. They can Teachers can grab them and use them in the way that best suits them. You'll notice up there that I've just got a wee corner that says the key competencies. That's from the New Zealand curriculum document. And one of the key competencies um, is thinking, and a lot of our resources support that. But they also support the others, managing self, relating to others, participating, contributing. Our resources are for teachers to utilise and for, to change themselves. The next three slides show the process of how those resources are embedded in the New Zealand curriculum document and road safety is embedded within the resources. The New Zealand curriculum document is, was established in 2007 and is the foundation for the development and implementation of all the resources we've used. We also use a thing called solo taxonomy and if you want to look it up, it's the structure of observed learning outcomes. It is a model that describes levels of increasing complexity in students' understanding of subjects. So this diagram puts all the concepts together Ray in Wen. the safe system. Yes? Ray Wen, sorry Hello. to interrupt a little bit. We've just had, um, a, your, your voice has just gone a little bit muffled, so I'm not sure if you're, you can move either slightly further away or slightly closer to the microphone. Oh, okay. Is that better? Um, keep going. Hello? Is that okay or not? Yes, that's better. That's okay, great. I'm holding it right by my mouth. Uh, so I'm sorry about that, everybody. Thank you. Um, this diagram puts all the concepts together. We have a safe system which causes the preconditions of learning and has been at the heart of the resources. Um, Melanie discussed the safe system and the um, implementation of that in New Zealand. Um, each resource has been co-constructed and assembled to follow the diagram. The New Zealand curriculum sits at the top and the goals of road safety sit beside it. And current learning theories so um, inform how the resources have been developed and what the outcomes will be for both the curriculum area and for the road safety objective. Each of the 60 or so resources which are online um, is based on recent learning theory, most particularly the work from Professor Hattie, who's in Melbourne University, on visible learning. Professor Hattie's work is discussed in our paper about changing mental models by Mary Chamberlain and Pam Hock, two of the most respected icons of New Zealand education. And we also have underpinnings of the road safety theory in each of the resources, which include guidance from papers by, work by McKenna, Fenstra, Zadik, Payne, Alton Lee, Rotary, Wondersitz, and many others. The next two slides will, slides will describe the way that the curriculum, which is embedded into the New Zealand curriculum document, works for us. So here you have the New Zealand curriculum document in the purple circle, and science in the New Zealand curriculum, which is also published by the New Zealand Ministry of Education, within the curriculum document. Then the New Zealand Transport Agency Resources and Sciences, the wee blue um, circle, and then the teacher who develops their own resources from that in the sort of a Barney Coloured circle 
right in the centre. So that's how our resource collection fits. So teachers adapt the resources to suit their classes and their needs. Uh, this is just an example of what those resources might look like. You'll notice, um, and thank you Venera, um, that the forces lesson was written by a person called Pam Hook, who I just referred to earlier, and um, undertaken by Lincoln High School in this circumstance. And you'll see how that fits in there. So they developed their own resource as part of their work and the education um, it was written up by us and then if you see just to the right of the screen there's a little feature in the Education Gazette of the Maths resource. So those are all resources that have been taken from the website and made into the school's personal work. And this is how they look. So in the New Zealand curriculum document you see there's a curriculum area which is uh, science and that has uh, values which are listed there, the key competencies which are listed there, the achievement objectives which are listed there and then the school develops their own learning intentions. All New Zealand teachers are provided with laptops from some form or other and they can just download these and pop them straight into their work plans and they're all in, in formats that they can change. So we also are very keen to have student voice on our website. So um, these are things that students have developed with the help of local government in this circumstance. So, um, they are all from um, schools, they've developed a project much in the way that Melanie described and we have um, popped it up online so other people could see it. We listen deliberately to our younger citizens and support them in their investigations. We try and support their imagination and creativity. We support inclusiveness and diversity and support participation and democracy in, in the experience of citizenship. We provide teachers of the students with the opportunities for co-construction of the resources. Uh, the New Zealand Transport Agency and the teaching practitioners work on those resources together. We support local centres of expertise such as local government and we work with concrete exemplars online as you can see. This is just a slide that shows where else our resources are. Our, on our own website which you can see the young chap at the back and then the second page hops in there is from Te Kite Iparangi, which is the Ministry of Education's website, and it's got some case studies. And the last one, which is the POM, which is our website entirely for teachers by the Ministry of Education, and I was also sitting up there. Kura Kaupapa Māori and Rumaki Māori, which are schools and classes that work entirely in Māori, have been co-constructing resources about aspects of their local area and publishing them to Reo, which is Māori language, with Waka Kotahi, the New Zealand Transport Agency. And I'm going to show you just four examples of those books. So these are books that we have published, um, co-constructed with the local kura. This page shows more of the student voice. Um, it has four different examples. When working with student agency and student voice, it's critical that the voices are heard and published with care for the IP of the school and the student, but with enthusiasm so that those voices can be noticed and a difference can be made. It is also worth noting that these four illustrations are from students who are using road safety as a context for learning rather than the purpose of learning. It may well be that the learning intentions and objectives were about procedural writing or algebra, but the outcomes include children being safe citizens and sharing a road safely. And on the website, there's a growing collection of research to support New Zealand teachers in their role. You'll see here work from Mary Chamberlain and Pam Hook, published both on the website and also in one of the research journals for teachers, the Education Review. The rectangle that is in the foreground shows work from our roadmaps, of which there are three, and this table comes from a meta-analysis meta of teaching and learning. And the data owes much to Sadira from Western Australia and to Vic Groves and all of our colleagues in Australia. All these publications can be found on the New Zealand Transport Agency website. On this slide is a picture of three roadmaps which contain teacher-friendly research and of versions of Sadira's work in Western Australia and our downloadable brochure for school communities about all modes of travelling safely. Tucked in at the back is the Road Safety Education Fact Sheets page from Victoria, Australia 
We're working on a set of fact sheets about best practice for road safety education, using these fact sheets with permission and adding Aotearoa New Zealand examples. Also on the website is a collection of practical resources to support New Zealand schools about choosing appropriate road safety education for their communities. I've discussed the New Zealand Transport Agency's curriculum resources for schools. They've been developed and trialled by teachers and are implemented through usual curriculum channels to teachers and work best when they use road safety education as a context for learning. The New Zealand Transport Agency works directly with schools but also with local government and New Zealand police to support best practice in teaching and learning. The curriculum resources are just that, resources. They're not programs or interventions, they're not awareness raising posters or campaigns, but tuck themselves into significant learning opportunities for students and with professional teachers to undertake learning and teaching best practice with these students. Thank you for having me as part of your conference today. Norera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks, Raywin. That was great. Um, really, really interesting. And um, again, just a reminder to everyone uh, that's listening in that we will be circulating the slides on the recording um, and links to relevant online resources as well, so you can have um, a further look at some of the, the transport agency resources that are available online. So thanks very much um, for taking part, uh, Ray Wynn. I'm just looking to see if there are any further questions. I'll just um, change the presenter back to me. So that we've got that there. And if anyone has any final questions, if you would um, like to just submit them now, uh, and I can, we've still got uh, both Fenera and Ray Wynn at the moment. I know it's, um, We've run a bit over time, so thank you very much to those of you that have been able to stay um, as part of this. As any final questions, if you want to uh, ask them now, we can put them to the speakers that remain. Unfortunately, Melanie has had to uh, leave, but we can always get her um, additional questions afterwards. So I haven't got any other questions currently. So it looks like that's um, all of them, in which case, um, thank you, everybody, for taking part. I hope you found uh, the webinar to be useful and interesting. Please do fill in the uh, feedback survey when it's sent round. Um, following the webinar, it is really useful to us um, in informing future events. A big thank you again to both uh, Ray Wynn and Venera and also Melanie, who has already gone, um, for giving their time to take part in the webinar today. Um, your presentations were all really interesting um, and inspiring, so we hope they've given uh, all of the attendees some suggestions and ideas going forward. Uh, and also a big thank you again to um, RSA Group who sponsored the webinar, and thanks to all of you for taking part. Good luck with your activities, and we'll end the webinar there. Thanks. Thank you.